All right, brace yourselves because the airport experience may soon become even more unpleasant to the extent that it could. The TSA recently announced two dismaying decisions to allow unionization of its workforce and also not to allow any more airports to hire private security screeners instead of the TSA. Here to break down what these decisions mean for the future of the TSA and your personal liberties is Nicole Kurakawa, Senior Policy Analyst for the Independent Women's Forum. Nicole, it's a pleasure. Welcome to Freedom Watch. Thanks for having me. What, what does this mean for the average member of the traveling public that the TSA goons who participated in the porn or grope now may be members of labor unions? Um, as you said before, problems, it was bad before and it's going to get a lot worse because this was an unaccountable bureaucracy and now there's going to be an unaccountable bureaucracy with an additional level of um, unions that are going to be in the middle of all these decisions. Ostensibly, they can't collectively bargain over all different aspects of, um, of, the, of, of how TSA is run, only the non-security aspects. But let's bear one thing in mind. Its middle name is security. So pretty much everything they touch has to do with security. So not quite sure how they're going to break that down. Um, but does, it, it really, it's, it's really scary. Does this mean that the, the TSA workers, and we're watching uh, some of them in their blue uniforms with their, their blue latex gloves, that they themselves will become a force within the government independent of the political appointees and civil service superiors who run and manage them? Is that what you're telling us? Yes, and there's a lot of them, too. There are about 50,000 of them that will join a government union. And accordingly, that's a lot of money that's going to go into union coffers then. Um, this has been something that the administration had pushed, or that uh, President Obama had pushed during the campaign trail. He said he, he really wanted collective bargaining rights for the Transportation Security Administration. And... Taking a step back, this is because union numbers in this country have been on the decline. Well, um, well so other, than, other than wanting their votes, why would he, as the president of the United States, want to have to deal with a union? Why would he want to create another force within the government? Why would he want to create some political power that could basically say to him, we want the porn and grope, we want that authority, <laughs> and we're going to negotiate for it in our next collective bargaining agreement? Well, there's a lot of money that um, all these different unions have been pouring into Democratic coffers. Look at the past election, the 2010 cycle, the, two, the 2008 cycle. So it's time to pay the piper. And unfortunately, the piper is from is those unions. Does anybody make the argument except uh, perhaps you and I and, and, and some of our friends that the TSA is basically unconstitutional, that it inserts itself in a private industry at the most important relationship between that industry, the airlines and the flying public, that it assumes unto itself a, a power nowhere granted to the government in the Constitution, that it blatantly violates the Fourth Amendment every minute of every day that it, it does its work? Unfortunately, there are not that many people that are sounding that call. I think what we see right now is, you know, people citing um, Article 1, Section 8, saying, well, it, it's defense. It's related to defense. And then, of course, the government always likes to fall back on its interstate commerce or um, that it's necessary and proper. So I think the big question then is going to be, will anyone ever even stand up um, and tell the government, you know, on some of these issues, you're pushing the boundaries. Got it. And Nicole, Nicole Kurakawa, it's a pleasure. Come back and join us again. Thank you. And now a few items from our Freedom File. Here's a follow-up on the Atlanta, Georgia Red Dog Police Unit we told you about last week. The Atlanta Police Citizens Review Board has determined that its police force is alarmingly unfamiliar with constitutional rights. The city's Red Dog Unit came under fire for botched drug raids and a recent warrantless raid of an Atlanta nightclub. The board found that the police officers involved in that club raid believed that it was appropriate and lawful for them to push innocent patrons to the floor and frisk them while holding them down. The board's chair correctly asserted that, quote, this is simply not the law. What's so damning about this report is that every one of those officers swore to uphold the Constitution, but clearly none of them understood what they were committing to. It's no shock then that the rights of the people of Atlanta are consistently violated by the police. Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak has taken a lot of criticism for shutting down the Internet in Egypt. But right here in America, legislation was first introduced by Senator Joe Lieberman of Connecticut that would give the president the power to shut down the Internet here. 
America, not only does the president not have the authority to control the Internet, it's simply not in the Constitution, but who could ever trust politicians with the power literally to shut down modern society? The Internet is a mainstay of freedom. If the government takes control of it, then our freedoms are in grave danger. Anthony McCorkle of Staten Island, New York, was stopped by New York Sanitation Police for, get this, recycling. Mr. McCorkle runs a paper route in Staten Island, and his customers leave him plastic bottles, which he takes and recycles and collects the bottle deposits. Sounds efficient and even good business, right? No. Not in New York City, where the government hates competition. In New York, it is unlawful for anyone but sanitation workers to remove recyclables from someone else's home. And when a sanitation cop saw Mr. McCorkle in a car full of bottles, the officer literally stole the car from him. America, what have we become when the government seizes property on a whim and punishes a man for recycling? It's sickening. And this type of irrational, ir irrationality is pervasive throughout the government. What are we becoming? A police state. Should barbers need a license to cut hair? What about the person who shampoos your hair at the salon? The credentialing scam that inflates prices and erodes competition and it's being proposed by the businesses themselves. Next. Right here on Freedom Watch, we talked about a group of barbers in Orlando, Florida, who were held at gunpoint by police for the heinous crime of cutting people's hair without a license. Apparently in Florida, you need a piece of paper from the government that calls you a barber in order to cut someone else's hair. While in Texas, you need a piece of paper from the government to shampoo someone else's hair. And in Louisiana, you need a license from the government to arrange flowers. And this so-called licensing trend is spreading across the country. What's more absurd is that some businesses are demanding this unneeded form of government intrusion, all in an effort to protect their turf. Joining me now to discuss this needless bureaucracy is Clark Neely of the Institute for Justice. Clark, uh, welcome to Freedom Watch. How, how, how does this work? At, at first blush, one would think, well, why would those in a business want more regulation? But when you look at it, you think, hmm, what they really want is less competition because they want a barrier for others who are trying to enter that business, right? You said it, Judge. Two words, economic protectionism. Put it this way. You know the saying that uh, a competent prosecutor could get a grilled cheese sandwich indicted? Well, a competent lobbyist could get that same cheese sandwich appointed head of any licensing bureaucracy you want to name. This is all about legislating people out of work in order to drive down numbers and drive up prices. Well, what about things like natural rights? What about, about your right and my right to engage into some voluntary transaction, for me to pay you to give me legal advice, or for you to pay your barber to cut your hair, or your florist to sell you flowers? In, in, in the big picture, what business is that of the government? What right does the government have to interfere with our natural right to trade money for goods and services? You're absolutely right. Those rights are protected by the United States Constitution. You have a constitutional right to earn a living in the occupation of your choice. You know what the problem is? The problem is that we have a judiciary that has been out of the business of enforcing the right to earn a living and protecting it in any meaningful way for over 75 years. We need those judges to get back in the game. We need them protecting our constitutional right to earn a living, and they're not doing it. What are some of the more uh, absurd, Clark, uh, areas that the government has decided to regulate? And, and just to be clear, for the most part, we're talking about state and local governments. We're not talking about the feds. I mean, who knows? The feds may get in on this someday. But for the most part, we're talking about state and local governments. That's right. Uh, there's any number. I mean, you, you think of a way someone's earning money in this country and someone's out there trying to put them out of business with occupational licensing. There's the state of Louisiana regulates who can be a florist, who can be an interior designer. Florida regulates who can be an interior designer. There's a few states that say you have to have a funeral director's license just to sell a casket, which for those of you who don't know is just a big box. Uh, we even had case, uh, I believe in Oregon, uh, a couple weeks ago where a little kid was selling lemonade at a county fair and the bureaucrats shut her down. So as I said, 
You think of a way that somebody's earning money, and I guarantee you there's some bureaucrat out there trying to put them out of business. Is, it, is, is this across ideological lines? I mean, some of the states that you mentioned, they're not exactly uh, known for being big government states. Is this a question of what the lobbyists can get from the legislature rather than a legislature that believes in freedom or small government or maximum individual liberty or low taxes? That's absolutely right. The, the problem is that legislatures are out of control they will legislate almost anything you can imagine if some lobbyist will come in and propose it. The key to this problem and the key to fixing this problem is an engaged judiciary that takes seriously the right to earn a living and protects it when we take bureaucrats to court. That's not happening right now. The Institute for Justice has created the Center for Judicial Engagement to turn the tide and get judges back in the business of protecting our constitutional right to earn a living. I hope everybody will check us out on the web. IJ.org. Got it. Uh, Clark Neely, you're doing the work of the angels, the angels that wrote the Constitution. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure, Judge. Thanks for having me on. The president spoke today to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in an effort to make nice with business, but some of my freedom fighters are skeptical. So am I. They're next. <laughs>